Hi everyone, welcome to Seabay event. Um, I'm sure you're enjoying your food, and today we're welcoming a great speaker, Bruce Friedrich. Uh, he's the founding partner of the New Crop Capital, which is a 25 million venture capital firm, provide seed angel Series A funding to startups that are trying to find alternatives to animal products and also support the tech startups to promote um, alternative to dairy, eggs, and animal agriculture. And he's also the founder of the Good Food Institute, which is a nonprofit organization that pr uh, promoting uh, the alternatives, uh, uh, animal products alternatives to animal agriculture. And he's coming here today to share with us the exciting development in this field, especially the big investments happening in the Silicon Valley, what's going on, and where is this going to affect our life, affect our career, and what's going on in the future. Let's welcome Bruce Friedrich. Hello. How's the food? Excellent. Um, I am thrilled to be here with all of you this morning. Thank you so much for turning out. Um, I want to thank uh, Heather and Eva and uh, Amy and the Yale Center for Business and the Environment for sponsoring this talk about the future of protein. Um, I want to start, uh, actually, this is just sort of weird, but uh, apropos nothing, did people see that Bill Gates bought the Seattle Times this morning? He buys it every morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, actually, participation portion of our time together, there'll probably be a few others. How many people in here like pasta? Wow, we have unanimity. Okay, not quite unanimity. We've got one pasta hater, um, but almost unanimity on pasta. How many people in here um, would go to your refrigerator take out eight plates of pasta, dump them in the trash, and eat one plate of pasta? Nobody. Um, probably all of you in this room, if you're um, at a talk about business and the environment, are aware of the fact that in the United States, we throw away about 40% of all food that is produced. But the thing about animal agriculture is, for animal agriculture, the most efficient need is chickens. And simply to produce chickens, you have to put nine calories into the chicken to get one calorie back out. So essentially, we're entering into a relationship when we eat any meat, and again, chicken is the most efficient, we're entering into a relationship wherein 800% of what was grown is thrown away. And that is just one of the reasons that animal agriculture is crying out to be disrupted. And that's going to be what I'll be talking about, the future of protein, blending markets and food technology to solve some of the world's bi biggest problems. And my focus is going to be specifically on animal agriculture and plant-based and cellular agriculture or synthetic biology as the disruptive forces that have recently entered into the scene and are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The first thing I want to talk about fairly briefly um, is just laying the groundwork. Why is animal agriculture problematic? Why does animal agriculture need to be disrupted by markets? And there are probably more than four reasons, but you can break down the really big ones into four reasons. The first one, is global poverty and sustainability. So the big question, how are we going to feed 9.7 billion people by 2050? The second one is environmentalism and especially climate change. How are we going to, how are the nations of the world going to meet their obligations under the Paris Agreement to keep climate change under two degrees Celsius by 2050? The third is health and the fourth is animal protection. Although I will say that when we're, when, if you go to um, ag tech conferences where you talk with people who are investing with the goal of disrupting animal agriculture to save the world, the two big questions are, 
how do we feed 9.7 billion people by 2050? How do we get to a sustainable food system? And what are we going to do about climate change? So those are the things that I'll spend just uh, a little bit more time on than the, than the health and animal protection issue. So the first one is sustainability and global poverty. And this one, I think, makes intuitive sense if you spend a moment thinking about it. So I weigh about 185 pounds. If I do nothing but lay in bed watching reruns of The Apprentice, I'm going to burn like 2,000 calories a day. Except maybe if I get excited, I'm firing Donald, fire him. Right, I'm revved up what's going on on the screen. Then my caloric intake goes up a little bit with my metabolism. Um, that same sort of relationship, not the bad TV watching, but the same sort of physiological relationship is true of all animals. Um, animals expend the vast majority of the calories that we feed to them simply existing. And then some portion of what we feed to them goes into feathers or fur um, or blood or bones or whatever, other things that we're not going to eat. So that once you crunch the numbers, chicken, the most efficient meat, still requires nine calories in to get one calorie back out. For pork, it's about 15. For beef, it's like 25. Um, for turkeys, it's like 11 or 12. Um, but again, back to the question, every time anybody is consuming animal products, it is as though you are throwing vast quantities of food into the trash. So a few years ago, this guy, he's the UN Special Envoy, or he was, the UN Special Envoy on food. And he pointed out that in a world where more than 800 million people are living in nutritional deficit, he said it is a crime against humanity that we would take 100 million metric tons of corn and wheat and turn them into biofuels. Because by taking that 100 million metric tons of corn and wheat and turning it into biofuels, we're driving up the price on the global marketplace of corn and wheat. We're turning corn and wheat into export crops from developing nations to developed nations to turn them into biofuels. And he said, while people are starving, it's a crime against humanity that the first world would take edible crops or land that could be used for edible crops and use them for biofuels. That's basically his argument. What do people think? How many people think that's, uh, he's got a tenable case? Yeah, most people think he has a tenable case. Um, and yeah, 100 million metric tons is an awful lot of corn and wheat being turned into biofuels. But the same UN Food and Agricultural Organization report that he was talking about and citing said that 756 million metric tons of corn and wheat are being turned into food for chickens and pigs and other farm animals. And the World Watch Institute puts it this way. They say, continued growth in meat output is dependent on feeding grain to animals, creating competition for grain between affluent meat eaters and the world's poor. So as our population explodes, especially in the developing world, there are obviously socioeconomic, sociopolitical issues with food distribution. Nevertheless, we have a global marketplace. And it is a fact that if you are buying wheat and corn, and this doesn't even get into soy, it's another 220 million metric tons of soy that is fed to farm animals, and then you know, oats and alfalfa and other crops as well. Um, if you are driving up the price for those crops, you are throwing subsistence farmers off their land and you are pricing out people who would otherwise have food to eat. The second issue um, is the environment. And this also makes intuitive sense. It's not just the nine calories in for one calorie out in efficiency. It's also all of the extra stages of production. So obviously, plant-based foods, you have to grow the crops. You put them on an 18-wheeler, and you ship them to the you know, manufacturing plant, to you know, the Anheuser-Busch plant to turn them into beer, which is vegan, um, or whatever other wonderful you know, plant-based food you want to create. And there are resources used and pollution created in that process. The thing about animal products is you still have to grow the crops, except now you're shipping the crops to a feed mill. And you're operating the feed mill. And then you're shipping the feed to the farm. And you're operating the farm. And then you're shipping the animals to the slaughterhouse and you're operating the slaughterhouse. It's three or four extra pollution, spewing, energy-intensive factories 
and multiple extra stages of massive gas guzzling pollution spewing vehicles driving around the roads you know, with animals or feed crops or whatever else on the back of them. Once the, num once the numbers are crushed, crunched, the inefficiencies of uh, raising animals for food, it's not just that nine to one. The United Nations released a report called Livestock's Long Shadow. It's a more than 400 page analysis of the inefficiencies and polluting capacities of animal agriculture. And they say animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems at every scale from local to global. So from the smallest and most local to the largest and most global, animal production is one of the top three contributors. Specifically, animal agriculture contributes to problems of land degradation, climate change and air pollution, water shortage and water pollution, and loss of biodiversity. And then, of course, the hottest topic in environmentalism, global warming. Animal agriculture causes 40% more global warming than all of the SUVs, the 18-wheelers, the jumbo jets, and all other forms of transportation combined. So animal agriculture globally is responsible for about 18% of climate change, where all forms of transport combined are responsible for about 13%. And this is what that, look, that looks like on a per calorie basis. Again, you've got uh, poultry is the most efficient of the animal products. But when you compare poultry to legumes, legumes produce, like soy, produce about two grams of CO2 equivalent per calorie. Uh, chickens produce 54 grams of CO2 equivalent per calorie, so 27 times as much, 2,700% um, each time we're choosing to eat chickens. And if you are, are looking for protein calories, which in development discussions is generally what they're looking for, it gets even worse. So again, chickens the most efficient, produce 40 times as much CO2 equivalent per protein calorie, 4,000% of the CO2 equivalent per protein calorie when compared to legumes. Um, and you can see the chart. Legumes, corn, wheat, it's about 40, with the wheat poultry differential is 14 times. Um, and then pork and fish, and then beef, you, you more than double the fish um, once you get out to beef. So just accentuating the point, 27 times more CO2 than legumes, 40 times more um, if what you're talking about is protein. Uh, about two years ago, the foremost think tank in Europe, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, more commonly referred to as Chatham House, they released a report titled Live Livestock, Climate Change's Forgotten Sector. And they said that without severe cuts in consumption, ag emissions will take up the entire world's carbon budget by 2050. They said, Shifting global demand for meat and dairy products is central to achieving climate goals. And in fact, they said that it is scientifically impossible if we maintain animal product consumption where it is right now, scientifically impossible that the governments of the world would meet their obligations under the, climate, under the Paris Agreement. And as probably all of you know, in the United States meat consumption, in the West, meat consumption is stagnating. But in the developed world, it's down here, but it's going up, which means that we're not going to just you know, stay at equanimity, it's going up globally, which means the Paris Agreement, unless we come up with a way to solve this problem, the Paris Agreement um, will prove to not be worth the paper it's printed on. So that's the environment. Um, degenerative disease, global health. This next slide is my only death by PowerPoint slide. I apologize for it in advance. I just want to get through the health issue fairly quickly. Um, and I guess sort of put an underline and an explanation point on the fact that Animal product consumption is absolutely unnecessary, and there's scientific consensus on that. The American Heart Association, a diet that emphasizes plant foods compared to animal-based foods, can lower the risk of dying from heart disease and stroke by up to 20%. The American Institute for Cancer Research, when it comes to American health, the research shows one thing very quickly, very clearly. We all need to eat more plants and less meat. And as probably most of you know, the top two killers in the developed world are heart disease and cancer. And in fact, heart disease kills more than half of men in the United States. You put heart disease here, you put everything else here. For men, heart disease is a little bit more. For women, it's a little bit less. Comes out to about 50%. And according to the American Heart Association, we can lower the risk by 20% by emphasizing plant-based diets. Similar quote from the American Institute for Cancer Research. The Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, a strong body of scientific evidence links excess meat consumption with heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, obesity, certain cancers, and early death, kind of summing it up. 
And then uh, a study out of Oxford that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences earlier this year said a shift away from meat consumption could cut premature, premature mortality globally by 6 to 10 percent. And if you pull the paper, what you find is 6 percent, we would have 6 percent less premature mortality, uh, saving globally more than a trillion dollars um, if we shifted to what Harvard Medical School recommends with regard to how much meat, meat we should consume, which is roughly um, about the size of a deck of cards on a daily basis. Um, if you go all the way to vegetarian globally, it goes to 8.5 percent. If you go all the way to plant-based to vegan, it goes to 10 percent. And uh, everybody from the USDA to the American Academy of Dietetics agrees that uh, shifting away from animals and toward plants is the healthiest, the healthy, healthiest diet. The final point, which I'll also go over fairly quickly, is animal protection. In the United States, uh, we eat more than 9 billion land animals just in the United States every single year. The vast majority of them are chickens, so more than 98 percent of the land animals we consume are chickens. So all of you who consume meat in this, uh, in this room, if you are like the average American, you are consuming about a tenth of a cow on an annual basis, a third of a pig on an annual basis, and literally dozens of chickens, and also dozens of fish. And this is how they, this is what uh, a chicken shed looks like. This is a chart that was in the Wall Street Journal about two months ago about the genetics of chickens and the fact that chickens are now growing their upper bodies more than seven times as quickly as they would naturally. Uh, but their lungs and their limbs and their, li and their uh, hearts don't keep up. And so the animals die from massive rates of heart failure, lung collapse, crippling leg deformities. Some poultry scientists at the University of Arkansas said that if a human baby grew as quickly as a modern broiler chicken, she would weigh more than 600 pounds by her first birthday. Wrap your mind around that. Like, think about a human baby. She's one year old, and she weighs more than 600 pounds. You know, that's what scientists have done to the genetics of chickens. Um, and that's the fourth reason that at the Good Food Institute and New Crop Capital, we think animal agriculture um, is in need of some serious disruption. So the question then is, how do we do that? And the brainstorm of both organizations comes from a recognition based on the science of dietary choice. So there have been about a gazillion studies. I think that's the precise number. There have been about a gazillion studies of why people make the choices that they, the food choices that they make. Um, and all of them come down to price, taste, and convenience. So if you go to McDonald's or KFC or Kroger or Safeway or whatever and you ask people, why'd you buy that, why'd you buy that, why'd you buy that, um, price will factor in, taste will factor in, and if it's not there, they didn't buy it. So convenience factors in. For the vast majority of people, uh, ethics don't figure in. So the brainstorm of the Good Food Institute and New Crop Capital is to create the products that take ethics off the table. Ben and Jerry's vegan ice cream is our solution to all of those global problems. Being a little facetious, but uh, if you've had Ben and Jerry's vegan ice cream, I guarantee the price knocked you over. Um, and if you're vegan, you bought it anyway, it's, uh, because the taste overwhelmed you with the uh, joy that you were about to feel. And uh, convenience, it's Ben and Jerry's, so it's kind of everywhere now, uh, which is uh, fantastic for people who like ice cream uh, but don't like dairy products for whatever reason. Similarly, there are roughly, um, you know, I don't know, this, I just took this off Google. I Googled people eating. This was one of, I don't know, in 0.2 seconds, lots and lots and lots of photos. They look happy, right? I'll bet none of them is talking about the environmental consequences or the, you know, what happened to the animals on the center of that table. And this brainstorm is the reason that Eric Schmidt the CEO of Alphabet, parent company of, of uh, Google, he was at the Milken Global Summit a couple of months ago, and he was asked to reflect on six technological innovations that he feels will improve life for humanity by a factor of at least tenfold, so by at least a thousand percent in the fairly near future. And he's Eric Schmidt, he's the CEO of Alphabet. He talked about 3D printers for infrastructure. 
He talked about watches that alert your doctor that you're sick before you know you're sick. He talked about self-driving cars. But the first thing he talked about was plant-based meat. And he talked about plant-based meat because of the first two things that I was chatting about. He said plant-based meat, because it is so much more efficient, this is how we deliver protein to the developing world. And he talked about plant-based meat because of climate change, because of the fact that plant-based meat is exponentially less contributory to climate change. These are um, Gardein's plant-based chicken, I'm sorry, these are Beyond Meats, um, plant-based chicken strips. And Bill Gates is an investor in this, and he invested after he tried it. And when he tried it, he said, uh, what, I was to, what I was eating was not just a clever meat substitute, it was a taste of the future of food. Our second, our second brainstorm, or the second technology that we're promoting, um, is clean meat. And clean meat is oftentimes disparagingly referred to as lab-grown meat. But it's, uh, A, it's not lab-grown. Once it's commercialized, this is what it looks like. So every processed food starts in a food lab, right? If you're eating something that you know, didn't come out of the ground and show up in the produce section of the supermarket, it started in a food lab. And so too, plant, um, clean meat starts in a food lab. But once it's commercialized, once it's being sold, it's being sold from factories. And the factories look an awful lot like a brewery. These are uh, bioreactors and uh, you know, big tanks that brew beer. And similarly, it will be big tanks that create meat that is exponentially more sustainable, that causes exponentially up to 95% less climate change, that doesn't require animal suffering, and that is clean. There's one company in the United States that is working on clean meat. It's called Memphis Meats. A couple of months back, Fortune Magazine said Memphis Meats was the most innovative tech in Silicon Valley. Not the most innovative food tech in Silicon Valley, the most innovative tech period in Silicon Valley. And one of the reasons, you know, it solves the sustainability problem, it solves the global, the uh, greenhouse gas um, climate change problem, and it's exponentially cleaner. In the United States alone, tens of millions of people get sick from salmonella or campylobacter or E. coli or some other foodborne pathogen. More than 100,000 people end up in the hospital, and more than 4,000 people die every single year because of the filthy factory farms and the filthy slaughterhouses that modern meat comes from. So this solves that problem as well. This is a slide from Memphis Meats about the fact that whether it's conventional or it's organic, beef or pork, the uh, cultured, which is, the, which is another word for clean meat, so clean pork, clean beef, doesn't have the antibiotic residues, doesn't require the antibiotics, and doesn't have all of the bacterial contamination. So that's what production looks like at scale. And those are the guys who are doing it. Uh, Memphis Meats, which uh, I was actually at Memphis Meats yesterday, hanging out with them. There's a film crew doing a documentary about what they're doing. And so I was with uh, the film crew and the Memphis Meats guys. The guy on the left is Uma Valetti. He's a cardiologist who was teaching cardiology at the University of Minnesota. He was trained at the Mayo Clinic. He was president of his chapter of the American Heart Association in Minneapolis. Um, and he got interested in the number of lives he could save and the amount of good that he could do uh, by founding this company and actually quit the company. And now he's, I mean, he quit uh, the University of Minnesota, and now he splits his time between where his wife and kids are in Minneapolis um, and San Francisco, where Memphis Meats, the business that he founded, is. And Memphis Meats was just conceived last October. It went through the Indie Bio, uh, the Indie Bio Accelerator out in San Francisco. And they came out in February, and they had their demo day, and they had raised more money, more than $3 million, than any of the other companies that went through demo day. The guy on the right is Nick Genovese. He is a tissue engineer who's been working with uh, Dr. Valetti for some time on this project at the University of Minnesota. And they decided that if they really want to accelerate the technology, they need to take it into the private sector. And they did that. Uh, Bill Gates is one of the believers in the idea of disrupting animal agriculture. On the plant, he wrote a blog called The Future of Protein, and he said, so far we've explored only about 8% of the world's plant proteins as potential meat alternatives. Remaking meat is one sector of the food industry that is ripe for innovation and growth. 
We might expect this kind of analysis from Bill Gates or one of the other sort of Silicon Valley forward thinkers like Eric Schmidt. But I love this quote from Robert Gamgort, the CEO of Pinnacle Foods. They bought Gardein for $154 million last year. And he said, plant-based meat is in the early stages of a macro trend, similar to the way soy, the soy and almond milk changed the milk category. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Pinnacle. It's a multi-billion dollar food conglomerate that brings you hungry man steaks and potted meat. And even they are getting into plant-based meat. And good, huh? Potted meat is fun to say. Potted meat. Um, not as fun as garbanzo beans. Anyway, um, the thing about this quote, I, wanna, I, I put this quote into, uh, into, into uh, visual form because I think it's interesting. Um, so Gamgort says plant-based meat is about to do what plant-based milk did. 15 years ago, plant-based milk was nowhere. Today, it's now approaching 9% of the milk industry. And for comparison, this is where plant-based meat is. So plant-based milk is $2 billion on a $24.5 billion milk industry. And every single year, plant-based milk is doing this, and plant-based meat, uh, animal-based milk is doing this. So it's closing the gap. It's getting more and more of a share every single year. Gamgord is saying that plant-based meat is going to do the same thing. Plant-based meat is currently under $500 million um, on an almost $200 billion animal-based meat market. So it's within statistical significance of not existing. So anybody who's had a Boca burger or Gardein chicken strips or something else in the last couple of days, that didn't actually happen to you. We close the gap, and we go from the graph on the left now, 0.25%, up to dairy parity, almost 4,000%, almost 40 times as big. What that means in terms of animals saved is almost a billion land animals. And Lux Research says that plant-based meat will be at a third of the market by 2054. What that means in terms of money is we're going from an industry that all but doesn't exist at $500 million relative to $200 billion for animal-based meat to $20 billion once we reach par dairy parity to $65 billion once we reach the prediction of the marketing firm Lux Research. Three of the companies that are uh, working on proof of concept are Beyond Meat, Hampton Creek, and Impossible Foods. These three plant-based companies have raised $400 million almost in just the last five years, and they've hit a $2 billion valuation. These are three um, Bay Area-based, plant-based meat companies. And then, of course, Memphis Meats, in its seed round, it oversubscribed. It hasn't gotten to Series A yet. So, oh, here's the Bill Gates quote. He ate the... Uh, Beyond Meat chicken strip, and he said what I was experiencing was more than a clever meat substitute. It was a taste of the future of food. Some of the venture capital funds that are investing in this space, um, mine, New Crop Capital, is pretty small. We're just $5 million a year, a total um, investment of $25 million. But we also have Kleiner Perkins, SOS Ventures, Obvious Ventures, which is the Twitter guys, Kosla Ventures, um, Horizons Ventures, which is run by the richest person in Asia, Li ka -shing. Um, and then Sergey Brin, philanthropically, uh, put about a million dollars into clean meat to create the first clean burger over in Europe. My nonprofit organization is called the Good Food Institute. And so New Crop Capital, it's really easy to explain what New Crop Capital does. We find the companies that we think are most likely to be maximally disruptive of animal agriculture, um, and we help them to, well, we give them money initially, um, and then we help to introduce them to other investors to ensure that they're able to raise their seed round and their Series A and their Series B and so on. Um, so that's New Crop Capital. And if you visit our website, newcropcapital.com, you can scroll down and see nine of the 11 investments that we've made so far. Um, the Good Food Institute has four program areas. The first one is fostering innovation. One thing that fostering innovation looks like that I would think people in this room might be particularly interested in is we have about 15 companies that we think need to be founded. So we've create, we, we have companies that would fill white space. And then we look for entrepreneurs and scientists and other people to actually start the companies. Um, and then we work with venture capital funds. Happily, we control one. 
um, to invest. And so we actually have created two companies so far. They're not at the bottom of New Crop Capital's um, website yet because we haven't launched them. Another thing that fostering innovation entails is coming to rooms like this and saying, hey, if you're thinking about entrepreneurship, think about plant-based alternatives to animal agriculture. Think about cellular and synthetic biology alternatives because this is an area that in which you can do tremendous good and it's also an area um, in which you can do very well for yourself. These are markets that are about to explode. We also reach out to synthetic biologists who might otherwise have been looking at going into chemicals, tissue engineers who might otherwise have been going into medicine, um, plant biologists who might have been going into drought resistance or you know, whatever else, um, and we say, hey, think about using your expertise in this other way, because there are big problems that you can help solve and be on the vanguard of making some, uh, some really exciting and interesting and innovative technologies. Um, our second program area is supporting innovation, and that has to do with working with the companies that exist. So we have a policy director who was teaching food law at Valparaiso Law School for the last five years, and she's joined us um, to help figure out the regulatory path forward for these companies, and then also to meet with people on the Hill to try to level the playing field for especially the plant-based companies. We also have a couple of scientists, one of whom has been building airplanes at Boeing for the last decade, one of whom is a uh, postdoc in recombinant proteins at UC Boulder, and they've joined us as an exceptional team for figuring out what the technological readiness assessment is going to be for both plant-based and clean technologies. And we've really been bowled over by the degree to which we didn't know things that we didn't know in plant-based. When we started with the clean technologies, so the tissue engineering technologies, we had sort of a vision of this is where we are and this is how we get to commercialization at a price point that is lower than conventional chicken, because that's the goal. And here are the, you know, the, the engineering problems we need to solve, and then we're gonna go out and find the people to solve them. But with the plant-based, there were all kinds of things we didn't even realize were a problem and it stems from the fact that this industry is so nascent, you know, less than one quarter of 1% of the meat industry, and so people are sort of forming companies, but they're not asking some of the bigger questions. So our scientists are tasked with asking the bigger questions. We also do things in supporting innovation, like introduce, we have an entrepreneur in residence who introduces people to venture capital funds that might be interested in funding them. Um, we have a network of 25 advisors. If you go to gfi.org, up slash our hyphen team, you can see our, um, all of our advisors who are available to the companies in this space to help ensure that they're successful and answer questions. Our third program area is corporate engagement. Um, that is outreach to grocery chains, restaurant chains, food service. That is all focused on the convenience aspect of uh, making plant-based foods more convenient. So uh, we did a, an analysis of the top 100 chain restaurants and we discovered that more than 100, more than 50 of them do not have a plant-based entree. Um, two of them, even the fries are cooked in lard, so there's literally nothing on the menu um, that is entirely plant-based. And we will be methodically reaching out to all of them uh, to make the business case for adding a veggie burger or veggie nuggets or whatever else. And then the last of our um, program areas, institutional engagement, um, maybe the most interesting. It's uh, outreach to foundations and governments and corporations to educate them about the first quarter of this talk, the sustainability piece and the climate change piece, and to some degree global health, and any institution that has as a part of its mission, we want to solve the climate change issue, or we want to put money into tech solutions for sustainability or global health or whatever else, we reach out to them and say, this is an area in which you should invest, and here are some researchers that if they have the money, they will help us answer the serum-free media question or the bioreactor scale-up question or the best possible plant-based protein question or whatever else. So finding the money and then pairing the money with the researchers, and a part of that is outreach to the meat industry itself. So we have a theory that who better to make plant-based or clean pork than Smithfield. Who better to make plant-based or clean chicken nuggets than Tyson? And we've been gratified, actually, by the degree to which the response to what it is that we're talking about has been pretty positive. So in January, Meeting Place Magazine, the lead editorial 
Um, and meeting is spelled M-E-A-T. So it's a pun. It's a meat industry trade journal, meeting place, which where you get your meat. Um, well, you get your information about meat. It doesn't actually have, there's not meat in the magazine. Um, the lead editorial from the editor was titled Hormel's Next Acquisition. And it was talking about the stuff I'm talking about. Sergey Brin, Eric Schmidt, the Twitter guys, um, Bill Gates getting into plant-based and clean alternatives to animal agriculture and suggesting that the meat industry should reconstitute itself as protein delivery, protein supply, rather necessarily than something that requires animal slaughter, um, which is something we're super enthused about um, and we'll be excited to really put it onto the radars of the sustainability reports. All of these companies put out sustainability reports. So our argument is what better way to, you know, what better information for your sustainability report than that you are taking this seriously um, and responding to consumer demand. So this is the Good Food Institute. This is our resources page. This is what it looks like when you go to our resources page. Uh, it's also just gfi.org up slash resources. There are academic and lab opportunities and papers for those of you who are like, want to geek out on the science of all of this. Um, GFI in the news, our self-congratulatory page. Um, select popular media is popular media about these technologies and some of these companies. So those of you who just want a, a sort of 10,000 feet level and not the geek out level, right below academic uh, papers is select popular media. GFI's top blogs was our attempt to sort of organize all of the stuff that we're blogging about into sort of a co coherent whole. Um, so if you want to find out about our take on something, you don't actually have to scroll through months worth of blogs. Um, the video gallery is exactly that. Um, and then the thing that I hope folks really will take a look at, well, I hope you'll take a look at all of it, but the one that I really want to draw to your attention is job op openings and funding opportunities. Look, I even put an arrow there uh, to accentuate how much I want you to look at it. And uh, at GFI, we have seven openings listed at the moment, I think, um, including business analyst and innovation manager, which are jobs that I would think uh, a lot of people in this room would probably be very well suited for when you graduate. Um, we also have intern opportunities, extern opportunities, volunteer opportunities, generally requiring at least 10 hours a week um, for three months. Um, Happy to work with you on getting credit for that work as well. We have work in the policy department, the innovation department, the entrepreneurship department, the science department. Um, so hope people will check that out and let us know if you're interested. We also have monthly entrepreneurship calls, um, which aren't on here. But if people want to hear how we're talking about the uh, 15 or so companies that we want to see founded, um, you can email me, and I will get you added to our entrepreneurship email list and e um, entrepreneurship calls. My email address is just brucef at gfi.org. Um, I also hope for people who are interested that you will send us your email address and we will add you to our email list. We put out about uh, two updates of things that we think are interesting in the field per month. Oh, I guess I really want you to do that. I put two arrows there. Um, and the last thing that I wanna, want to uh, talk about just briefly um, is another area. Plant-based milk gives us tremendous hope in the like, very recent future, and really this is pretty recent future as well. Um, 100 whatever years ago, I mean, Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living, and the Model T came onto the scene you know, 2,400 years after that. So this is, this is historically that. But um, 1894, 175,000 horses in New York City. They were producing 50,000 tons of manure every single month, and one history explained that by 18, 1894, American cities were drowning in horse manure. They were plagued by flies, congestion, horse carcasses, and traffic accidents. In 1898, there was the first urban planning conference that had ever been held, and the only item in the gen on the agenda for the urban planning conference was, what are we gonna do about the horse carcasses um, and the horse manure? And after about a day, they decided there is no solution to this problem. We're just gonna see what happens. It's kind of, uh, you laugh, but isn't that like the global answer to climate change right now? It's a little less funny when you think about it that way. Um, in any event, um, they, they called it off. They couldn't come up with a solution, so they called it off. And uh, in 1908, the Model T was introduced. By 1912, there were more cars than horses. 
We have other problems with cars, but the uh, horse carcass flies and manure problem um, was quickly relegated to being a thing of the past. And it wasn't, and the ASPCA was founded because of the maltreatment of horses on the streets of Manhattan. That is why the ASPCA exists, but that is not why horses were taken off the streets of Manhattan. It was technology that did it. And in the same way that none of us here to you know, go back to our homes or travel across the country, none of us are gonna hop on a, hop on a horse, we're all gonna get in a plane, a car, or a train. So too, I am absolutely convinced that the myriad problems of animal agriculture will be solved by food technology, by a combination of food technology and ethics, and we will come in the fairly dear fut near future to see the idea of raising animals in order to eat them as just as ludicrous as the idea of hopping on a horse and setting off for San Francisco. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have about 15 minutes. Your name, where you're from, and right into the mic. Thanks. And comments are also welcome. Doesn't have to be questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Nathan Hall at the Forestry School and here at SOM. Um, I'm wondering how similar these clean meats are, you know, as far as cellularly, biophysically, et cetera, to actual meats. You know, are we still going to see the same kind of health issues if people, you know, maintain a similar or even higher level of, you know, this type of meat consumption as compared to, you know, the existing meat consumption? Uh, and then also how energy intensive are these bioreactor facilities that produce these clean meats? I'm sure they're a lot better than, you know, typical, you know, raising hundreds of acres of corn to feed, uh, you know, feed a lot of cattle, but just, you know, in general, do you have any numbers on like the energy intensity of those systems? Yeah, so those are great questions. Um, and the first one is the health question. Um, well, I guess it's, it's how similar it is, is it? It's identical. Um, meat grown in essentially a meat brewery is identical to meat grown on an animal. It's the exact same thing. Um, and consequently, my death by PowerPoint slide about heart disease and cancer and diabetes and uh, all that is the same. Um, there is a conversation among people who are interested in clean meat, who are promoting clean meat, about the fact that you could tweak the meat. Um, you could make it have more or less heme, more or less omegas, more or less cholesterol, et cetera. Um, but our theory is we don't want it to, I mean, my theory is I don't want it to be a specialty food. So clean meat is not for people who would otherwise be eating beans and rice. It's not for people who would otherwise be eating veggie burgers. It's for the 95% of the population that is eating conventionally produced meat. And it's here, this is the exact same thing, but it's cheaper. It's not going to kill your family with, with bacteria. It's more transparent, right? You can walk down to your friendly neighborhood meat brewery and watch them doing it. Um, they're passing laws to make it illegal to find out how conventionally meat is produced. It's illegal in a lot of states to go on, well, it's illegal to go onto the farms, but they're even criminalizing undercover investigations on farms and slaughterhouses in a bunch of states. So we've got transparency, we've got cost, we've got ethics. Um, that's, who this is, that's who this is for. Um, remind me what your second question is. Yeah, so um, it, for, for plant-based meats, you're talking about 900% more efficient than chicken. For clean meat, it's 300% more efficient than chicken. Um, and then uh, like 1,000% more efficient than beef. Um, but still, a third as efficient as plant-based. Um, and so the clean meat, the, the clean meat really is for the people who, no matter how good the plant-based meats are, they just have a visceral desire to eat animal flesh. Um, that's who clean meat is for. And there are really a lot of people, and a lot of people who are in, in that category, I think. Those are great questions, and I, I saw um, in the last couple of days, I was actually talking to Dr. Valetti yesterday 
um, about the fact that Elon Musk is talking about it costing, he says by 2026 we'll be able to go to Mars. I think he said it will cost $10 billion. And, uh, and Uma was like, I can send, him clean, send clean meat with him for a fraction of that. Um, <laughs> which is true. Um, and it solves problems that actually exist. Um, but um, yeah, it's interesting. NASA was, uh, NASA was the first major entity to fund clean meat research in 2002 uh, because they wanted the astronauts to be able to eat meat without having to bring you know, animals up there with all the inefficiencies that that entails. And NASA ended up deciding, well, actually, they can just eat vegetarian. Um, so uh, that's why they, they ended up no longer funding the clean meat research. But uh, in terms of the fuels, uh, it remains to be seen um, as, the, as the technology commercializes. So um, we don't know for sure yet, but I can tell you that the people who are working on it um, take those concerns extremely seriously. Now, using solar, um, I can get a natural gas generator from there and get back to the bioreactor. Uh, um, well, we're not two bioreactors yet. Um, so that we're looking at bioreactors with a view towards scaling up. I mean, the bioreactors. They're, they're tiny. Um, so at, at the moment, no. Um, yes? Two questions for you. Um, one is, you talk a lot about imitation. I'm a non-vegetarian. Um, and one thing I find really interesting about that movement is that it's all imitation meat. Why not just have what we have out there today, which isn't trying to be chicken, it's actually marketing. Um, and then second question is, um, how do you feel about companies like the Canary Bell Campo or these kind of sustainable meat production companies that are trying to change the way that you grow cattle or um, the meat poultry? And what's your kind of feeling on that on this issue? Yeah, I mean, I guess on the on the first thing, I don't think I probably said imitation meat. I think I said plant based meat and clean meat, so they're um, still meat. But you're right, they're they're a, protein within the meat. Yes, I mean they are. So um, the people. I think um, if you re there's a really interesting book. It's called Meat Hooked. It's by a French journalist named Marta Zaraska. Um, and it's sort of the uh, love affair of human beings with meat. And it appears to be extraordinarily hardwired. Um, I grew up in Minnesota and Oklahoma. The food groups were McDonald's Big Macs and Dairy Queen Blizzards. And um, there are very, there's certainly nobody who's vegetarian for ethical reasons. Well, that's not true. Most people who are, uh, who are vegetarian for ethical reasons don't have an aesthetic objection to meat for the same reason all of the meat eaters in this room like salivate it and get excited at a turkey on the table or hamburgers on the grill or whatever else. Um, that is appealing to a lot of human beings, except that a lot of vegetarians have said, I don't want to support the environmental problems. I don't want to support the unsustainability. I don't want to cause animals to suffer. But I would still like that product. And then, sorry, what was your second question? Um, I just got off a of red eye. I was in San Francisco no yesterday, so my synapses aren't firing quite as quickly as they should be. Um, I was just working with sheep in the Bay Area, and there's a lot of um, uh, farmers who are trying to change the way they grow. Um, you know, their biggest cattle raised ranch, you know, dirt ranching, and Del Campo is one of them. They're a large cattle farm um, ranch. And so I was wondering what your take is on these people that are working with traditional animals and the whole breed, um, introducing food versus these uh, kind of synthetic alternatives. Yeah, I mean, we see, um, we see our goal as combating factory farming. Um, and we see both plant-based meat and clean meat getting to price points at which they compete um, for taste, price, and convenience with factory farmed meat. Uh, the people, the sort of Michael Pollans um, and Eric Schlossers of the world um, who want high welfare, regener regeneratively farmed animal products um, are very much not our target audience. It's not the people who are eyes wide open making their meat purchasing decisions. It's the 98% of people who are, are not that is, uh, is what we're trying to displace. Yes. Yeah, so um, one of our seven open positions is director of international outreach. Um, 
And as we expand, and we're doing very well in terms of development, so I think we probably will be, um, I won't be surprised if we double in size next year. Um, five of the positions that we want to hire will be internationally focused. One of them is focused on India, one of them is focused on China. Um, we have put our toe into those waters already. Um, so we have some people who are working on India um, and are looking at the situation in India for both plant-based and clean products. Um, we also have, we also, uh, our policy director is looking for legal interns to help us with the regulatory landscape globally. Um, China is even more exciting because the Chinese government has actually announced that they want to cut meat consumption in half. Um, so we have a line to the Chinese agricultural minister and we're hoping to have a conversation with him about these issues. Um, and once we hire our international director and especially once we hire our person on the ground in China, the group Wild Aid, which uh, produced some commercials for the Chinese market with James Cameron, Cameron and Arnold Schwarzenegger focused on educating the population um, about the climate harms of animal agriculture, um, is very happy to work with us um, on promoting these alternatives. Um, obviously, the alternatives are going, there's going to be a lot that's cultural about what will and won't work. Um, although, for better or less, uh, the U.S. culture is, has certainly uh, infected India in a big way. I know less about China. But, uh, but we, yeah, 95% of the world is not here. Um, so we definitely need to be looking um, outside the borders of, of the United States. So, here and then here. Um, my name's Abby Cheskis. I'm from uh, suburbs of New York City. And you talked about how um, part of the work of your company is to convince uh, <coughs> supermarket chains and restaurants to source these these different types of food. But I'm wondering if you guys also work on kind of the next step, which is how consumers will actually decide to make the choice to purchase those foods when the other options are still available. Yeah, I mean, we're, um, we really are focused on getting the price point and the taste and the convenience right. And then our theory is, assuming these companies are marketing in the same way that, for example, soy milk and almond milk marketed and got to almost 10% of the market, that same sort of market dynamic will kick in once we've, once we've solved that problem. Um, it is certainly the case that there are tons of environmental, sustainability, global health, and animal protection organizations that are also educating people about the fact that pretty much everybody who eats meat would do well to cut back, if not cut out. Um, so that's happening simultaneously, although our theory is um, to use markets and food technology. And just, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this was clear or not. We're a, we're a nonprofit. The, the Good Food Institute is a nonprofit organization, so we're uh, funded exclusively by by uh, donations from people, and we are 501c3, so it's just FYI. I, I guess uh, I don't call us a company as much as a nonprofit organization, so that's where that sort of si aside came from. Um, yes. Oh, hold it down. Okay. Hi. I, hi, I'm Ellie. I'm a student at School Management and School Forestry. Thanks so much for the talk. I have uh, one comment and then one question. One comment is, I noticed that in a, in a lot of times in explaining the whys of why this is a good idea, something that's left out is the, the people protection component. So you talked a lot about the really poor conditions for animals at factories, but something that uh, I recently was just learning a lot about, uh, I went to a, a talk and someone was from the Occupational Safe and Health the Safety and Health Administration was just talking about the really, really horrible conditions that the workers have to ex experience working in these factories. So that's that's one part of the problem that I, I would like to see uh, brought up more, that, that human component. Um, and then my question is, um, in terms of insect insect based proteins, is that an area that maybe you've aligned with, you know, allies who are also working there, or have you thought of? I'm curious, you know, why why the focus is on plants, and have you at all thought about expanding that to look at insects? Um, so I want to I want to riff first on the first question, mm -hmm. um, and I will say um, I've been talking about the harms of animal agriculture for a really long time, and um, when I give a longer talk that's exclusively about the harms of animal agriculture. Um, I talk about the surf labor conditions of especially the chicken farmers. And for people who are interested in that, well, the short version for people who are interested in that is uh, Google my name and chicken farmers and you'll read a law review article that I wrote about it. But there's a book length treatment by a guy who wrote about ag for the Associated Press for 20 years 
um, called Meat Mark, no, Meet the Meat Racket. And it is a riveting, riveting read. Um, and then, um, yes, the farmer, so you know, they're not even farmers, they're basically surf laborers, are treated abysmally, and then slaughterhouses are the most dangerous job in the country. And Human Rights Watch released a report called Blood, Sweat, and Tears, yeah, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, um, documenting the conditions in slaughterhouses. <coughs> and they said, this is America's human rights crime, the way that slaughterhouse workers are treated. Um, when I used to give a talk just about the harms fairly regularly, which I don't do very much anymore, um, and we would do surveys afterwards, you know, what were the issues that resonated with you? What are the things that you remember at the end of this talk? Um, sadly, those two things didn't come up. Um, they did slight, they were the worst, they did the worst. Um, and then the environment, as you might imagine, um, human health issues, and then animal protection, um, and then environment, and then working conditions. Um, so to the degree that we're focusing on, I mean, and also um, when we're thinking about what the problems food technology is going to solve, like the really big problems that uh, impact investors are interested in um, are the global, war global warming and sustainability. So that tends to be where we focus. But I, I ran a homeless shelter in a soup kitchen for six years in inner city, in inner city Washington, DC. Um, and those issues certainly you know, resonate for me as well. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Dan. I'm a first year forestry student. Uh, question I have, uh, what is the reaction of, if any, of the conventional meat industry in the United States? Are they aware of this? Are they trying to get on board? Our hope is that they will get on board. So, um, you know, meat, meat Marketing and Technology News had that editor's letter in the January issue suggesting that they get on board. Um, I'm sorry, not Meat Marketing and Technology News, the Meeting, Meeting Place magazine. Um, in just the last couple of days, a guy named Dan Murphy, who's been a common, commentator, uh, he worked at the American Meat Institute, he founded Meeting Place magazine, he has an essay in Drovers, which is a cattle industry journal about clean meat. Um, so our hope is that will continue. We would love to see them doing R&D, we would love to see them doing M&A. Um, I know the, the time is up. Um, want to release anybody who wants to be released, but I'll hang out up here for as long as anybody wants to chat.